I think the, the point of discussing scale is very novel to me at this point because the social enterprise sector is still, I think many of us are still struggling through survivability. The second factor I, I believe is very important is the environment. Even if you want to scale, uh, is, there an, uh, is there an opportunity for you to scale? You know, and, and the primary uh, barrier that we see is the human resource challenge, uh, especially at the senior uh, level. When you, can you get enough people to help you scale the business? The other part is obviously what uh, Harold mentioned, resources, funding, etc., which need to be addressed. Uh, in our case, uh, we are addressing a uh, sort of a very immediate need of healthcare access in smaller towns. So in that sense, the opportunity is there. There is a huge gap in the market in terms of providing quality healthcare. So the opportunity exists and, uh, you know, we had to reconfigure our genetic composition, so to say, to address that, uh, that need. So it came with its own challenges. So we made some false starts, scaled back, scaled up. So I, I, I believe that scaling up is not a linear um, sort of process. Sometimes you have to take a few steps back and then uh, go ahead. And uh, we are still at a stage where we are trying to figure out how do we go from one state, two state to multiple states. And I think we, we learn from other enterprises as we go. Well, of course, one thing um, you all need to keep in mind when scaling up is money. Everyone needs money to grow bigger. And often you get your money from the private equity shops. So I want to bring in uh, Shankar Narayanan here and um, ask you, what do you look for in a business when deciding whether to invest in the business? Do you look at the business's potential and promise to scale? Or would you be willing to put your money in a small business that could make an impact but has no interest in scaling? See, I think both of these are not mutually exclusive. You know, uh, if you try getting scale before uh, you are convinced your prototype works, uh, then it would be scaling without any meaning or any purpose. You know, if you see the great companies, whether it is Infosys, whether it was Ford Motor Car Company, what they were very successful was in doing something very simple, very, very well. And once they're able to do that very, very well, they're able to duplicate it uh, on a fairly large scale. So if you don't get the first part of it right, that is getting your basic thing right, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to scale and then it gets completely out of control. Uh, typically, people go on a large scale, are large organizations who have been left behind. For example, Citigroup, you know, when uh, the credit card revolution happened, they were behind. So at that time, they needed to get scale fast. So what they figured out was, say, instead of uh, advertising, getting people sign up for cards, they just did some kind of demographic measure and mass mail credit cards to various people and figured out they'll have some losses due to fraud, but it was still a cheaper way to make an impact. So that is the kind of situation where you try and scale up, though you haven't proven something uh, in a narrow sense. You know, I've been doing private equity since 93, and generally, uh, though I've lived a few years in Hong Kong, I've primarily focused on the Indian market. Uh, what I feel for success, we typically try and look at companies uh, that have a business, have been running for some time, have some kind of profit after tax. So this is the broad metric we do. Uh, but more than a business, more than an industry, you know, more than the financials of a company, uh, what in the 17, 18 years I've been in private equity, I've figured out there are two key attributes when I look back at all the deals that I've done. Uh, one is, you know, the passion and conviction and drive of the entrepreneur. And the second is his integrity. Uh, you know, absent these two, you know, it can be an absolutely fabulous business idea. Uh, normally, most of the businesses uh, run to ground. And which is why we as a group spend a lot of time, <coughs> you know, just meeting the entrepreneurs, understanding them, uh, etc., just to see, primarily in unstructured meetings, to just see if they have uh, these two char characteristics. Uh, we have done a couple of investments, uh, which uh, we, uh, I sit on the board of a housing finance company, that typically gives housing loans up to about 10 lakh rupees. Um, means great business, uh, you know, a company called Repco Housing Finance. Um, uh, you know, our net NPAs are less than 1%. Um, they've built it very successfully in the southern states, and they're slowly trying to move up north. Um, one of the things, and Repco Bank, which is a majority share owner, uh, is owned by the government. So, for example, one of the challenges we faced was 
uh, you know, we had some kind of asset liability mismatch. So we thought if we got long-term money, uh, we could help give smaller loans, uh, uh, larger loans for a longer period so that the EMIs come down. Um, so we got a 23-year concessional loan from one of the U.S. government agencies, but RBI wouldn't give us permission because they felt it is going to be used for real estate. So, you know, you face those kind of challenges. But I, I, I have a very, very positive view of what is happening in India. We invest in another dairy company as well, which does about 1,000 crores of sales in milk. Um, I think rural India is changing in many ways. I think uh, there is a hunger, there is a drive. Uh, you know, briefly <coughs> touching on the question of microfinance, because we have looked at investing in several microfinance. I have personally spent, uh, you know, several weekends in uh, Nachiket Moore's IFMR, as well as Repco Foundation, which works in the Nilgiri skills, etc. Um, I think what is happening is a part of a natural evolution. You know, it has now almost become axiomatic that the capitalist system or the free market system uh, is the best way for any economy to go forward. Um, and that is the thing that fosters innovation, fosters entrepreneurial drive, fosters creativity. But uh, it becomes very essential for markets in, in their own interest to have a sense of fairness about it. And the problem in microfinance which has happened, and it's a natural evolution, uh, it'll eventually settle down. Both IFMR and Repco does remarkable work. And part of the reason I think they're successful, not controversial, is they're very, very transparent, very, very open. Uh, I don't think they're very, very targeted in one narrow dimension of trying to make profit at any cost. Eventually, you should make profits, but disclosure in such a way that your borrower understands fully the implications of what is happening. I think that is very, very vital, uh, you know, for the future of the country. Actually, we had a very interesting panel in Carlisle uh, a couple of years back, just before this whole mortgage crisis happened. There were four Nobel laureates. Um, <clears throat> I think Kenneth Arrow, Robert Lucas, uh, I think Merton Miller, and a guy called Hanneman. So all of them were arguing about this. And Hanneman suggested something that, look, maybe all these mortgage borrowers don't know completely what they're getting into. And the other Nobel laureates just piled on him and said, no, this is free market, you know, it's fine. And eventually he turned out to be very prescient. So I think in things uh, like microfinance, disclosure in such a way that the other person understands the full implications. Otherwise people take money for all kinds of reasons and then becomes a problem. So the key thing, you know, in an overall context is that it has to be Capitalism, which is not crony capitalism, it has to be capitalism with the heart so that eventually that inequity thing goes away. Then we have a, a great, great kind of framework, and that is the framework eventually where entrepreneurs could get their business ideas, flourish, and people like us could act as a catalyst in that change. We could get, we could, apart from pro providing equity money, we could get them access to markets world over. We could get access to cheaper financing. We could get access to managerial talent, et cetera. And firms like us have a great role in that context to pay. But we would never ever do something where in which we feel that we would make some kind of return, but the society in which we operate is harmed in the long run. So that, for us, is very, very important. Because that's really the issue that came up with the uh, microfinance uh, situation last year in India. Of course, when it happened, you know, being a journalist, I was sent off right away to Andhra Pradesh, go cover the story, find out what's happening on the ground. And when I went there, I have to be honest, a, a lot of what I heard was from small MFIs was, you know, it's pressure from private equity shops, it's uh, pressure from investors. We have to show them uh, returns at a certain time, we've got to fill our books. And that's the reason perhaps MFIs are a little bit too aggressive with borrowers. So I'm just curious, while I have you here, what's your take? See, my, <clears throat> see, eventually it boils down to disclosure. You know, you, uh, you can't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. So eventually if people, um, see, uh, you know, uh, in some ways the whole microfinance story became like a fairy tale. You yes, know, that yes. people get these 20, 30,000 rupees and you're going to build these uh, billionaire entrepreneurs out of it. Uh, you know, nothing like that happens, you know, in real life. Um, the reason why a vegetable vendor is able to take 30, 40,000 rupees and make something out of it is because his margins at that small scale are huge. You know, so the alternative he has is from some kind of loan shark uh, who's uh, taking and doing anything. 
So when I saw Repco Foundation, which was essentially working uh, like a foundation, but which again is getting converted, but uh, and IFMR was I, I really saw, and we looked at investing in a whole host of uh, private things. Uh, I think the staff's level of commitment in making sure people understood what exactly they were getting into uh, was very, very good. And consequently, I think they're building models that are much more scalable because uh, you are really doing some kind of effort uh, to build it. So, you know, so it eventually, and I've told this to some of the private sector MFS I saw, you know, means to go to heaven, you have to die. I can't die and you can't go to heaven. <laughs> so eventually, if a uh, <coughs> you know, microfinance company wants to grow, uh, it is very, very easy to uh, you know, write a check and <coughs> you know, then use coercive, semi-coercive kind of measures uh, in what essentially is a civil matter. And then once that kind of thing starts happening, uh, it's a free country. You have a free press. Uh, you have democratic institutions. Uh, there is a bash backlash. And a lot of the backlash um, is probably deserved. It means I, I won't even say it's uh, undeserved. But I think what unfortunately has happened is this has eventually happened at a small fringe. I, I don't think the whole core uh, had this kind of issue. But unfortunately, you know, it's an era of sound bites. You know, means I'm very careful what I say. And then the whole thing uh, gets uh, distorted. And then eventually, this whole, all these microfinance guys became the big bad guys. Uh, and, uh, you know, and the politicians had to act, uh, you know, pr probably they had some kind of interest in doing, etc. But I still believe access to capital, you know, since 1991, uh, I think one of the single biggest transformation things that have happened in India is access to capital, access to risk capital, you know, to people who have a good idea, great idea, whether it's at a microfinance level or at a larger level. You know, since 93 in private equity, I have seen so many people, you know, kids from middle class, lower middle class, even poor families who have had a great idea, great education, get access to this capital and build really world-class companies, world-class businesses. And microfinance does it in a small way. Um, you know, venture capital does it slightly larger. Private equity guys like us do it on a larger scale. I think it is very, very vital, you know, the future of this country that this access to capital to people is not choked. And uh, in killing this access to capital at a microfinance level uh, could create you know, serious issues in uh, development of the country. At the same time, microfinance people have this huge responsibility to make sure that there is complete education of people who borrow money. Because I have seen microfinance companies who charge some kind of fee up front, some kind of rate up front. And they think they're getting an elephant, and the poor people probably get a mouse in bargain. Means so they that kind of thing, uh, you know, if yeah. it happens, would harm uh, long term. So eventually, you know, what do you need in a free market uh, capitalist system? It's a regulator who has both a heavy touch and a light touch, and there is some kind of a framework. And then within that framework, you tell people you do it. And I think it is time for someone to do it. And the government can give a lot of positive incentives. You know, the government uh, instead of giving grants in budget. Well, maybe they can just guarantee some kind of microfinance debt or something, et cetera, and you can create a market out of it. Well, and that's if a good time to bring in the government view, I think, and I yeah. will let you respond to that. But uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar, you've been working in rural development for more than 25 years. You're currently working, and you have been working on a nationwide poverty eradication program. God only knows what kind of scale that involves. So give us a, a sense of how you go about trying to include everyone, trying to make eco economic opportunity available to all, which of course is Harold's mantra. How have you